is a public domain book that I received free legally from archive.org. I hope you guys enjoy this. The Secret of Light by Walter Russell. I guess I need to do a little setup for this within the last week. I was watching a Santos, a rant, Santos Bonacci. So I'm thankful that I got turned on to uh, Walter Russell because of him. Thank you, Santos. But the first time that I heard him, I did not know enough about anything to really follow along and um, grasp what he was saying. And uh, this time when I listened, I knew a lot more. I've been studying this stuff for a while, and uh, slowly it is sinking in, very slowly. So anyway, 43.16 minutes into this one-hour deal, he hits the meat of it. Walter Russell. Um, fascinating. I think that he was in the same circles as Tesla. And there's another gentleman, I don't remember what his name is, but I'll be looking him up too. Walter Russell was not a tinkerer per se. He was like an Einstein, but he didn't get that kind of credit. Now, maybe he did back in the day, I don't know. But I know I never heard of him till this weekend, and apparently he was brilliant. So I want to read what he did. I want to understand it, see what's there. Because basically what I think I'm understanding is the ideas that Walter Russell had. Einstein used, other people used. So um, I think there's some good stuff here. I think it's the simple mechanics of how the universe works, which absolutely fascinates me. So if you're listening to this, I hope you enjoy it. And here we go, The Secret of Light by Walter Russell, 3rd edition, University of Science and Philosophy, formerly the Walter Russell Foundation. Copyright 1947 by Walter Russell. Copyright 1971 and 1994 by the University of Science and Philosophy. There's a cool wheel here. I shall include it. To the one God, the Universal One, this book is humbly dedicated. The Cosmic Clock. Cool. Okay, here we go. Concerning the Divine Iliad. The Divine Iliad is the basis of this book. The Divine Iliad is an inspired message from the Creator to give man the needed comprehension of his relation to his universe, to man and to God, for the coming cycle. Man progresses in cycles of approximately 2,500 years. At the beginning of each cycle of his growing awareness of the light within him, God sends messages through prepared messengers to further his comprehension of the light. Comprehension of these cosmic messages gradually exalts mankind into higher beings, and thus each cycle is one more step for man toward full awareness of the light and of his oneness with God. The Divine Iliad cannot be fully published for many years. As much of it as can now be published will appear in these pages. Further portions of it will be released as the world is ready to receive them. Walter Russell the wave. In the wave lies the secret of creation. Authors forward. Jesus said, God is light, and no man of that day knew what he meant. The day is now here when all men must know what Jesus meant when he said, God is light. For within the secret of light is vast knowledge, yet unrevealed to man. Light is all there is. It is all we have to deal with, but we do not yet know what it is. The purpose of this message is to tell what it is. Today's civilization has advanced far in knowing how to deal with matter, but we do not know what matter is, nor the why of it. Nor do we know what energy, electricity, magnetism, gravitation, and radiation are. Nor do we know the purpose of the inert gases and what they are. Nor do we know the structure of the elemental atoms, nor the gyroscopic principle which determines that structure. Nor are we aware of the fact that this is a two-way continuous universe of balance in all effects of motion and not a one-way discontinuous universe. Nor have we even yet heard of or suspected the most important of all principles in physics, the voidance principle 
and the mirrors and lenses of space, which are the cause of illusion in all moving things. Nor do we even consider the entire material electric universe to be the illusion which it is, there being no reality to it whatsoever. Nor have we the slightest inkling of the cause of curvature of space, nor the voidance of that curvature in planes of zero curvature at wave field boundaries. No one knows how it is that crystals get their various shapes. It will amaze the world to know that those shapes of crystals are determined in space by the shapes of the wave fields which bound the various elemental structures. Nor have we the slightest conception of what constitutes the life principle, nor the principle of growth, nor the simultaneous unfoldment, refoldment principle, which repeats all patterns in nature sequentially and records and voids them as they are repeated. Nor are we aware of that recording principle by means of which the Creator carries forth the sum totals of every sequential cycle in his unfolding and refolding universe into the very end of its manifestations upon one planet and its beginning on a new one. Nor are we dynamically aware of the souls and seeds of things. These roots of universal repetition are now but metaphysical abstractions to religion and physical guesswork to science. Within the secret of light is the answer to all of these heretofore unanswered questions, and many more, which the ages have not yet solved. This revelation of the nature of light will be the inheritance of man in the coming new age of greater comprehension. Its unfoldment will prove the existence of God by methods and standards acceptable to science and religion alike. It will lay a spiritual foundation under the present material one of science. The two greatest elements in civilization, religion, and science will thus find unity in marriage of the two. Likewise, human relationships will become more balanced because of greater knowledge of universal law, which lies behind all of the processes which light uses to interweave the pattern forms of this electric wave universe. There is no department of life which will not be vitally affected by this new knowledge of the nature of light, from the university to the laboratory, from government to industry, and from nation to nation. I therefore give it to you with all of its clarity, as I myself have become aware of it, from behind the scenes of this cosmic cinema of light illusion, which is our universe. Walter Russell. And he's written a lot of books. Um, there's a few that are available. I don't know that I'll read them all, but The Message of the Divine Iliad, Volume 1 and 2, A New Concept of the Universe, The Self-Multiplication Principle, The Secret of Working Knowingly with God, The Electric Nature of the Universe, The Sculptor Searches for Mark Twain's Immortality, The Fifth Kingdom Man, The Dawn of a New Day in Human Relations, The Immortality of Man, The Book of Early Whisperings, Your Day and Night. Plus there's some home study that he and his wife Lau Russell did. It was called Home Study Course in Universal Law, Natural Science and Living Philosophy. And then the next one is Scientific Answer to Human Relations. Another one is Atomic Suicide. Another one, The World Crisis, Its Explanation and Solution. A Vision Fulfilled, The One World Purpose, A Plan to Dissolve War by a Power More Mighty Than War. Books by Lau Russell, his wife. God Will Work With You But Not For You. Love, A Scientific and Living Philosophy of Love and Sex. Why You Cannot Die, Reincarnation Explained. Ooh, cool, I'm going to have to check that one out. Okay, so those are some other books that are available. Let's just jump into it. Part 1, Omniscience, The Universe of Knowing. Okay, so there's 200 pages. Still, well, maybe more than that. Oh, cool. Hopefully these are here. Part 3 is Postulates and Diagrams. That I want to see. I am the light, I alone am. What I am, thou art. Thou art the light, thou art one with me. Man may know me by desiring to know me. To know me is to be me. Through my light alone can man know me. Man is light when he knoweth that he is light. 
Man is me when he knoweth that he is me. All men will come to me in due time, but theirs is the agony of awaiting. From the Divine Iliad. The Secret of Light, Part 1. All power is from the One. All power returns to the One. Omniscience, the universe of knowing. Chapter 1, The Eternal Question. Who am I? What am I? Why am I? Whither am I bound? What is my relation to the universe, to man, and to God? What is truth? How am I to know truth? Whence cometh my power? What is the source of my power? How am I to find balance? In my dealings with my fellow men, now can you see why I fell in love with this guy immediately? Hello. <laughs> how am I to find balance? In my dealings with my fellow men, how am I to know that balance in our interchange, which will enrich both him and me? Countless are the religious teachings, and many are the commandments to goodness. But goodness is still veiled from my eyes, like a thick mist which hides thy light, which I vainly seek. I stumble into its darkness, unbalanced I fall. O thou unseen one, tear from my eyes the blinding veil which hides the path to thy light, that I may find my way to thee. That is the cry of the ages. That is the unanswered question which is arising from the heart of this awakening generation. Civilization progresses in cycles. New comprehension periodically transforms mankind into higher beings. A new cycle of 3,000 years duration is now in its birth throes. God's omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence are centered in the consciousness of every man. But few there are who know of the oneness of their self-soul with the universal self-soul. Man requires many millennia to begin to be aware of that. Each cycle of man brings him nearer to his awareness of his oneness with the light of his self-source. Man lives in a bewildering complex world of effect, of which he knows not the cause. Because of its seemingly infinite multiplicity and complexity, he fails to vision the simple underlying principle of balance in all things. He, therefore, complexes truth until its many angles, sides, and facets have lost balance with each other and with him. Truth is simple. Balance is simple. Rhythmic balanced interchange between all pairs of opposite expressions in natural phenomena and in human relations is the consummate art of God's universe of light. It is also the law. In this one fundamental universal law lies the balanced continuity of all creative expression in God's electric wave universe of two conditioned lights in seeming motion which record God's one whole idea of creation into countless seemingly separate parts of that whole idea, the voice within. The great unanswered question of man has a simple answer. The silent voice within every man is ceaselessly whispering it to his awakening consciousness. Every desire written upon the heart of man is carried to the source, and its answer will come. But few there are who ask comprehensively, and fewer still who hear. Many are the ages of preparation for worthiness to hear it, for man's consciousness is insulated from his source by the sensations of his electrically conditioned body, which he wrongly thinks of its being his mind and his personal self. What he calls his objective human mind is but the seat of electric sensations of his body. What he mistakes for thinking is but an electric awareness of things sensed and recorded within the cells of his brain for repetitive usage through what is termed memories. Memories have no more relation to knowledge of universal mind which is in man than Victrola records are related to the source of their recordings. What he thinks of as his living body is but an electrically motivated machine which simulates life through motion extended to it from its centering self-soul, which alone lives and wills the body to move. What he calls his subjective mind is his consciousness, his spiritual storehouse of all knowledge, all power, and all presence. That consciousness is his self, his eternal self, through which his omniscience, omnipresence, and omnipotence are expressed as he slowly becomes aware of his presence within him. 
the electrically oscillating nerve wires which operate his bodily mechanism act almost entirely through automatic reflexes and instinctive control and to a very little extent through mental decisions each cell and organ of his body has an electrical awareness of its purpose and each fulfills that purpose without any mental action whatsoever upon the part of the intelligence which occupies that body the heartbeat for example is purely automatic the white corpuscles of the blood rush to repair an injury to the body as automatically as a bell rings when a button is pushed in this body and its electric recording brain man thinks that he thinks and lives loves and dies he thinks himself conscious while awake and unconscious while sleeping unaware that in all nature there is no such condition as unconsciousness when sensation ceases in sleep man does not say that his tooth is unconscious when it is put to sleep by short-circuiting the electric current in the nerve wire which gives sensed electrical awareness to his tooth he knows that his tooth cannot be conscious but he does not know that his body cannot be conscious nor does he yet know that consciousness never sleeps never changes for consciousness in man is his immortality it is the light which he is unknowingly seeking but assumes that the sensation of his brain is his thinking man is still new he is barely out of the dark of his jungle for the million or more years of his unfolding he has relied upon sensation for his actions and the evidence of his senses for his knowing he has been aware of the spirit in him only a very few thousands of years in this beginning of his new awareness he is confused knowing not which is mind in him which is consciousness in him and which is sensation he has not yet learned that bodies are but self-created mechanisms which manifest their centering self and that self manifests god as one with it likewise he has not yet learned that bodies neither live nor die but repeat themselves continuously and forever as all idea of mind likewise repeats itself the wheel for example is a mechanism consisting of a hub spokes and a rim a little part of the wheel touches the ground feels it then leaves it to disappear from oh wow i just caught that hello did you catch that a little part of the wheel touches the ground feels it then leaves it to disappear from reach of the sensations which connect rim spokes and ground but then it reappears when that happens to man we say he was born lived and died when it happens to the apple the flame or the tree we say the apple was eaten the flame has gone out and the tree is decayed we say that because only a small part of the cycle of any idea comes within the range of our senses the larger part of the cycle is beyond our range of perception just as the larger part of the wheel is beyond the sensed perception of the ground we do not yet know that the invisible part of the cycles of all idea is as continuous as the wheel is continuous the cycle of the apple is light reaching from the sun and earth to that positive half of the apple cycle which we hold in our hand the negative half of the cycle is light returning to sun and earth for repetition as another manifestation of the eternal idea of the apple the same is true of the flame the tree or any other part of the one whole idea of creation the flame goes out to our sensing but it still is likewise the tree the forest mountain planet nebula of the far heavens appear disappear and as surely reappear likewise man appears to disappear and reappear again and again in countless cycles to express eternal life of the spirit in eternal repetitions of that part of the man cycle which the body of man can sense man never dies he is as continuous as eternity is continuous jesus rightly said that man shall not see death for there is no death to see or to know likewise the body of man does not live and having never lived it cannot die the spirit alone lives the body but manifests the spirit that which we think of as life in the spirit of man manifests itself by willing the body to act actions thus made by the body under the command of its centering soul have no motivative power or intelligence in themselves they are but machines motivated by the omniscient and omnipotent intelligence extended to them
These things we do not yet know, for man is in his infancy. He is but beginning to know the light. Be ye forever transformed. Man is forever seeking the light to guide him on that long, torturous road, which leads from his body's jungle to the mountaintop of his awakening soul. Man is forever finding that light, and is being forever transformed as he finds it. And as he finds it, he gradually finds the self of him which is the light. And as he becomes more and more transformed by the God-light of the awakening self within him, he leaves the jungle farther below him in the dark. There are those who seek the light, who are discouraged, because they seemingly cannot find it, wholly unaware that they have forever been finding it, unknowing ones expect to find it all at once in some blinding flash of all power, all knowledge, and all presence. It does not come that way until one is nearing his mountaintop. Man cannot bear much of the light at a time while his body is still new and too near its jungle. All who are well out of the jungle have already found enough of the light to illumine their way out of its dark depths. He who is far out of the jungle and still seeks the light in the high heavens is forever finding it, and is forever being transformed as he finds it. One cannot for one moment remove his seeking eyes from his high heaven. For ever so slight a glimpse below into the dark brings him back to the fears of the dark, which tempt him to plunge back into them. Look ye, therefore, forever upward into the high heavens of inspiration, where glory awaits the fearless, all-knowing seekers of beauty in the purity of the universal light. To him whose eyes are in the high heavens, the light will forever come, and he will be forever transformed as he finds it. The dark road from his jungle to his mountaintop of glory becomes ever more illumined during the ascent from body to spirit. It is a hard but glorious road to climb. All must make the climb. The ascent of man from the dark to the light is the forever repetitive play of man on the planets of suns. When all of mankind has found the light, the play will be finished. Likewise, this planet will be finished as an abode for man. It will then be rolled off into its ever-expanding orbit while Venus is gradually being rolled into place to become the stage for the next repetition of the ascent of man in this solar system. We actors of the play must therefore be content with the lines of the play revealed to each of us in light. We must likewise be ever joyous at our continuous transformation, as each one of us learns our part line by line, the better to fulfill it worthily. All parts of the play are experiences which become the action of the play, all man's experiences are part of his unfolding. Each experience is a part of his journey from the dark to the light. All experiences are steps in that journey to his mountain top of glory. All experiences, therefore, are good experiences. There is naught but good. There is no evil. There is naught but life. There is no death. I am the one, the all. Glorify thou me, the one whom I am. For I am all, and no other is. I, the sexless one, am unity. What I am thou art, for thou art me, thou art the whole. Glorify thou thyself, for in so doing thou art glorifying me. I, the one whole, am knowing mind. I exist to think. All thinking is light of my knowing, but my thinking is not me. I am creator, creating with my thinking. Out of my light of knowing are my two lights of thinking born as sexed pairs of opposites for repetition as sexed pairs of opposites. To think is to create. I create with light. Nothing is which is not light. I think idea. Light registereth my idea in the two sexed lights of my thinking. And form is born in the image of my thinking. Form hath no existence, nor have my imaginings. These exist not, for they are not me. I alone existeth, I, the all. I create all imaged body with the inbreathing of my pulsing universe of me. My universe is my image, but my image is not me. All things are my image, but they are not me. 
and though I am in them and they in me. From the Divine Iliad. Okay, chapter two. Creator and creation. God, the creator, is all there is, all that exists. God's creating universe of matter in motion appears to exist. To our senses, it sequentially disappears to reappear. It has no reality, but it simulates reality through the illusion of two-way projected lights in motion. God, the creator, is the one being, the one person, the one mind, the one thinker, the one self, the one life, the one soul, the one power, the one reality. God's creation is the imaged, patterned form of God's imagining, built in his image. It is the body of God, the recording of his thinking, created by him for expressing the oneness of life, love, mind, soul, and power, which is in him alone the one light. God is light. God is universal mind. Mind is light. Mind knows. Mind thinks what it knows. Mind thinks in two opposed lights simultaneously, projected from their centering white light source and sequentially repeated in cycles. God's thinking and imagining are qualities of God's knowing. God's knowing mind is timeless and still so also are God's thinking and imagining timeless and still. So likewise, man's thinking and imagining are as timeless and still as is his knowing. Stillness never can be motion or become motion, but it can appear to be. Motion merely seems, but stillness always is. The universal equilibrium can never be other than its own balance, but it can seem to be. The illusion which is motion springs from stillness and returns to stillness. This is a universe of rest. There is naught but rest in the universe. Mind knows its one idea of creation as one whole. Mind thinks its one whole idea into seeming parts. Hence, the illusion of motion, which we call creation, and the illusion of substance, which we call matter, Matter, motion, time, change, dimension, and substance have no existence. The light of knowing mind alone exists. There is but one mind and one thinker. The one light of knowing mind is self of God. It is the universal self which centers all omnipresent self-creating bodies of God's selves. This self-creating universe is the mind-imagined body of God and record of God's thinking. We can know God. We cannot know his body, but we can see it. Likewise, we can know him. Likewise, we can know man. We cannot know the body of man, but we can see it. What God is, man is. God and man are one. Our seeming duality. We seemingly live in two universes, the still cosmic mind universe of knowing and the moving thought of mind rhythmic wave universe of sensing. We cannot sense the cosmic universe of God's knowing, nor can we know the thought wave universe of God's thinking. The cosmic mind universe of the one light of all knowing is all that is. The vibrating thought wave universe of sensing merely seems. The cosmic God light. The one still light of God is the cosmic light which watches over all creating things at countless points locatable by man but invisible to man. Man's senses have misled him into believing in a force called magnetism which attracts compass needles and lifts tons of steel. These phenomena of motion are due to electricity and not to magnetism. The cosmic light is absolutely still. It neither attracts nor repels. We now need to comprehend the nature and purpose of the magnetic poles, of suns, planets, and all other moving extensions of the one light. He had magnetic poles, in quotation marks, P.S. Likewise, we need to know the nature and purpose of the two electric workers, which interweave this light mirage of seeming motion and dissolve it sequentially for rebuilding. This will give a foundation of knowledge to man which will enable him to see behind the illusions which deceive his senses. 
The time has come in the history of man's journey from his material jungle to his spiritual mountaintop, when it is imperative that he must live more and more in the cosmic light universe of knowing, and less in the electric wave universe of sensing. Man must know that his power lies in the stillness of his centering self, and not in the motion by means of which he manifests that stillness. He must know that his self is God in him. Also, he must know gradually the dawning awareness of the cosmic light of God in him, for which it comes an awareness of his purposefulness in manifesting the light and the power to manifest it. Man must now know the universe of God, for which it is instead of what his senses have made him to believe it to be. Also, he must know that this forever creating universe, which seems so real to him, is but a cosmic cinema, conceived by the master playwright. It is but an electrically projected, spectrum-colored light and sound wave motion picture play of cause and effect, thrown on the black screen of imaged space and time. The cause is real. The effect is but a simulation of the reality. The self of man is cause. His self-creating body is effect. God's universe of magnetic light is static. God's perpetually creating electric wave universe of two moving lights is dynamic. It forever moves. The two moving lights are projected through each other from the static one to create the illusion of the idea they but manifest. The illusion which manifests the idea of creation through seeming motion is not the idea which is seemingly manifests. Creation is the product of mind knowing expressed in form by mind thinking. The product of mind is not the idea which it simulates. No idea of mind is ever created. It is but simulated by form and motion. Idea is eternal and belongs to God's still universe of knowing. Form of idea in matter is transient, but is eternally repeated as transient form of idea. The positive principle. The foundation of the spiritual universe is stillness, the balanced stillness of the one magnetic light of God. Balanced stillness is the positive principle of stability and unity. In it there are no negations. The negative principle. The foundation of the physical universe is motion the ever-changing motion arising out of pairs of unbalanced conditions which must forever move to seek the balanced stillness of unity from which they sprang as multiple pairs of units. Unbalanced motion is the negative principle of instability, multiplicity, and separateness, which is this physical universe of electric octave waves of opposed lights. In the negative principle, there is no positive. It is composed entirely of pairs of negations, which are forever voiding each other, canceling each other's action and reaction, thus negating each other by never allowing either one to exceed its fixed zero of universal stillness. Quality begets quantities. The still magnetic light universe of God's knowing is an invisible, unchanging, unconditioned, and unmeasurable quality from which visible, changing, conditioned, and measurable quantities spring to simulate those qualities through two-wave motion. There is no one word in any language to express that quality, so we must use many words, all having the same meaning but different connotations. These words are mind consciousness, love, life, truth, desire, knowledge, power, balance, and law. The God quality of the one light is seemingly transformed into quantities by being divided into pairs of oppositely conditioned light pressures of this electric universe. These divided pairs are then multiplied into countless octave wave units of light pressures and set in opposite directioned motion to create the illusion of sequence, change, dimension, condition, and time in a universe where none of these effects of motion exist. The calm sea, for example, is an unchanging, unmeasurable quality of oneness, of sameness and stillness. Upon its calm surface there is no change, nothing to count or to measure. The moment that quantities of waves spring from that quality of calm, those quantities can be measured. 
Likewise, they are forever changing, nor are there two points in them which are similarly conditioned. This creating electric universe is composed of moving light waves, which spring from a calm sea of the one still light. It is a universe of moving parts of quantities which simulate the quality of stillness, from which those quantities spring. The quantities of divided and conditioned pairs of opposite lights, which thus simulate the one, are not the one they simulate. The Creator is one mind, indivisible. Creation is one whole idea of mind divided into countless simulated ideas of mind through motion. The simulation of idea thus expressed is not the idea that it expresses. Parts of the one whole idea are only seeming. There are no two separate or separable things in the universe. There is but one whole simulation of the one whole idea. Everything that is is of everything else that is. All things are indissolubly united. From the Divine Iliad Every happening anywhere happens everywhere. The milkweed fluff floating lazily in the summer sky affects the balance of the whole universe of suns and galaxies. Every part of the universe moves in interdependent unison, as the wheels of a watch move in unison. The watch wheels are geared together mechanically. The rhythmic wave universe is geared together electrically. The entire universe is one and must be kept in balance as one. Changes of condition in any one part are simultaneously reflected in every other part and are sequentially repeated in it. Say thou these things in words of man's knowing, for verily I say I am within all things, without all things, and involved in all things, for I am everywhere. All things are omnipresent, for all things extend from mind of me, and I am omnipresent. All omnipresent things are omniscient, for I am within them, and I am omniscient. When man's consciousness telleth him of my presence within and without him, he will then know all things, for I know all things, and I am he. All thinking things manifesteth all power, when consciousness within them recognizeth their omnipotence. Until then, things are naught but things, manifesting me not, being but blank slates upon which to write my mighty thoughts for blind eyes. For I am omnipotent, I give all power to him who asketh, but no one may ask of me, who is not aware of me. See thou to it that man will knoweth that, and manifest thou thyself that principle of power in thine own works. For I say to all the imaged forms of my imagining, that power lieth in them to manifest the balanced light which centereth them by making the one light appear as two unbalanced lights, which interchange sequentially but equally. And again I say, that all things which man senseth are but waves of dual light, which record my electric thinking in the imagined forms of my imagining. And also I say that the imagined forms of my imagining have no being, for I alone have being from the Divine Iliad. Chapter 3. Sensation and Consciousness God is consciousness. Consciousness is static. Consciousness is the knowing of mind. Knowing is static. Consciousness is the spiritual awareness of being, of all knowing, all power and all presence. Thinking is electric. God's thinking is expressed by two-way moving wave extensions from consciousness. Like a lever swinging up a fixed fulcrum, or like waves extending from the calm sea, thought expression is dynamic. Thinking belongs to the electrically sensed and conditioned vibrating universe of motion. Thinking is the motionless principle in light which creates the illusion of motion. The self of man belongs to the static, invisible, conscious, unconditioned universe of knowing. We express knowing in the dynamic, visible, electrically conditioned universe of sensation. Sensation is the electrical awareness of motion simulating the spiritual qualities of the one idea 
by creating imaged quantities of separate forms which seem to have substance. Consciousness is real. Sensation simulates reality through motion of interchanging lights, but the mirage of a city is not the city it reflects. Confusion and misunderstanding as to whether we are thinking consciously from knowledge or sensing electrically from memory records stored in our brains have led us to the necessity of distinguishing between the two by the common usage of such terms as the human mind and mortal mind. We know full well while using them that there is but the one mind of the one living God of love. The universal mind centers every particle and mass in this universe, animal, vegetable, or mineral, electron, atom, or sun. Man is the only unit in creation who has conscious awareness of the spirit within him and electrical awareness of dually conditioned light acting upon his senses. I think that last part may not be correct, but whatever. All other units of creation have electrical awareness only. Man alone can be freed by body to think with God, to talk with God, and be inspired by his centering light. All other units of creation are limited in their actions to automatic reflexes from sensed memories built up through ages of sensing and recording such sensing as instinct. Likewise, the same confusion leads us to the adoption of such terms as subconscious mind and superconscious mind. There is but one mind, functioning universally within all creating things, and that one mind is not stratified nor divided into the more or less. There are no differing conditions of the one mind, nor are there different kinds of minds. Imagination. God is the imaginer of his one idea. All imagining is God's imagining. All creating forms in this thought universe of God's imagining are built in the image of his imagining, creating in his image. All forms in this creating universe of imagined forms are but electric recordings of God's imaginings. They have no existence. Records of idea are not the idea they record. They have no substance. They are but black and white lights of sun-centered wave fields of space assembled in vibrating systems to simulate substance in an objective universe which is not, but seems to be. God's imagining never began and will never end. It was not created at some remote past time by some vast cosmic event, as commonly believed, nor is it condemned to a heat death by expansion into nothingness. Sensation and Consciousness. This is a creating universe, not a created one. God did not begin to imagine at some fixed point, for time does not exist. This light wave universe, which records God's knowing by his thinking and imagining, is as eternal as God's thinking is eternal. Inspiration. Inspiration is the language of light, which man uses to talk with God. Inspiration is that deep awareness of the consciousness of being which differentiates the genius or mystic from the being of average intelligence. Inspiration in man is accompanied by an intense mental ecstasy which is characteristic of all who become intensely conscious of their closeness to God. Inspired geniuses forget their bodies while deeply conscious of their existence as holy mind. Their bodies, thus forgotten, act almost automatically in obedience to instinct and cell memory reflexes. Inspired geniuses translate God's knowing into words of man for the soul of man. They uplift all mankind by re-inspiring all who listen to their ecstatic words and rhythms. He who attunes his heart to the messages of genius purifies himself. No impurity can there be in his heart, for verily he then is, in communion with the Holy One. Man alone, of all my creating things, hath begun to hear my whisperings. Since his beginning my still small voice hath whispered within him that I am he and he me. But even now barbaric man on thy small new world heareth dully, and maketh idols, which he treasures before me. For he is still new, he is but in the ferment of his early brewing. 
For I say that all things which floweth from life of me have life of me flowing through them. N to the least of these, but I say that N though my light of immortal life floweth through those mortal symbols of my thinking, it toucheth them not in its passing. When they shall know the light of me in them, then they shall be me and I them. From the Divine Iliad. Chapter 4. Cosmic Consciousness. Beyond the genius is the mystic. The mystic is one who has attained cosmic consciousness by a complete severance of the seats of consciousness and sensation. He is then almost totally unaware of his body and is totally aware of the light of God centering him. Omniscience comes to him in that timeless blinding flash of light, which is characteristic of a complete severance. This experience was described in the illumination of St. Paul. Every timeless flash of intense inspiration which comes to any man is a partial illumination, for inspiration is the manner in which new knowledge comes to man from the cosmos. Of all mystics, Jesus was the outstanding example of all time. He was the only one in all history to have known complete cosmic conscious unity with God. The Bible refers to cosmic conscious experience as the illumination, or being in the light, or in the spirit. In all history, less than 40 cases of partial cosmic consciousness are known, and probably not more than three of these anywhere nearly approach the complete state of illumination experienced by the Nazarene. Cosmic consciousness is the ultimate goal of all mankind. All will know it before the long journey of man is finished. But there are many in this new age just dawning who are ready for it in part, if not fully. Many desire it fully, but it is best that it come bit by bit, for the complete severance is very dangerous. The ecstasy of this supreme experience is so great that one does not wish to come back. The power of severance of soul from body is within easy accomplishment, but to step back into the body is very difficult. The way to gradually attain cosmic consciousness is to intensify one's conscious awareness by much aloneness and companionship with God while manifesting Him in every moment and in every task of life. Moment by moment, companionship with God brings with it so great a realization of oneness with Him that the transformation into that full realization of unity is apt to take place at any time. The deterrent to cosmic consciousness is the feeling that God is far away instead of being within, and that we can reach that far away God only through sources outside ourselves. Hello, hello. He who would interpret the rhythm of me in art must walk his path in ecstasy, undiverted by deviations, that he may see me only, and hear naught but me. Say thou to man these words. I am the source of inspiration. To him who seeketh inspiration through me, I say, Learn, thou to walk my path strongly in the light, for in the dark thou canst not find thy way to me. The path to me is light, and by it thou canst well see thy way to me. I am the soul of art. To him whose soul would touch my soul, and feel the heartbeat of its mighty rhythm, I say, in so far as thou knowest thyself as light, shalt thou know me as light. I am beauty. In beauty must man be born anew. Through beauty must knowing man become ecstatic man. To him who would add ecstasy to his knowing, I say, seek me in truth, for only in the rhythm of truth shall thou find ecstasy. Verily, I say, the creations of ecstatic man are my creations, for they are balanced things, and I am balance. To him who wouldeth create unbalance, I say, untruth exists not in my house. I alone hold balance, and the eyes of those who see through me are immune from all but balance. For I am balance, I am energy, and I am rest. I am the light of love and truth. Upon that foundation have I laid the cornerstone of my universe. From the Divine Iliad. Chapter 5. Creative Expression. Inspired man alone can create enduring things. 
To create, we must first conceive. To conceive, we must stop thinking and know. All sensing must cease. There is no power in thinking. Thinking but expresses the power which lies in knowing. We must project ourselves into the still light of knowing to commune with God. We must become one with God to conceive idea in order to produce the form of that idea. A concept must precede its manifestation in form. The culture of the entire race is given to it by the few inspired ones who know God in them. They alone know immortality. The art of a civilization long outlives the civilization. The pyramids of Egypt still speak of the creation of a race which is long gone from the face of the earth. The sculptural and architectural beauty of Greece still tells us of a type of creative genius which has never been excelled. The great in the arts are few. Art alone endures. All else passes. Great art can be created only by working moment by moment with God as co-creator. When man and God thus work together, they commune one with the other as one person. The language of their communion is the language of light, which man calls inspiration. When man works alone, his works are as the winds which blow. When man works with God as co-creator, his works are forever enduring. Every great genius manifests this law, that he is one with the God mind, that God in him is the source of every thought, and that he is inspired by that omniscience and omnipotence within him, which makes his work enduring. All knowledge existeth, all knowledge cometh to man in its season. Cosmic messengers periodically give to man such knowledge of my cosmos, as man is able to comprehend. But that which he can bear is like unto a thimbleful out of the mighty ocean, for man is but beginning to comprehend. When man knoweth the light, then he will know no limitations. But man must know the light for himself, and none there can be who can make words of it. For light knoweth light, and there need be no words. From the Divine Iliad. Chapter 6. Knowledge. Knowledge is cosmic. It belongs to the still light of the positive principle. It never can become a property of the two negations which constitute this mirage universe of matter in motion. To know all things means to have all knowledge of the whole one idea of the cosmos as cause. It does not mean knowledge of created things which are effect of cause. The whole cosmic idea is simple. It can be known by anyone of average intelligence. Its bewildering complexities lie in effect of cause. Man cannot know transient effect. He can know cause only. He can but comprehend effect. Man cannot know a sunset sky, for example, but he can comprehend it if he knows its cause. Knowledge is therefore limited to cause. All knowledge exists. All mankind can have it for the asking. It is within man, awaiting his awareness of its all presence. Knowledge cannot be acquired by the brain from without. It must be recollected from within the consciousness of self. Gradually dawning conscious awareness is but gradual recollection of the all-knowing which has always been within man. Man cannot acquire knowledge from books or schools. He can but acquire information that way, but information is not knowledge until it is recognized by the spiritual consciousness of man. Just as food is not nourishment for the body until it becomes a part of the bloodstream, information gained by motion of the senses must be returned to the stillness of the source before it becomes knowledge. For the same reason man cannot acquire knowledge from the so-called facts of matter, for there are no facts of matter in a universe of transient matter in motion. All matter in motion is but a series of illusions which deceive man into drawing wrong conclusions. It is impossible for man to draw right conclusions from his observation of matter in motion until he has acquired the ability to translate dynamic effect back to cause. This he can do only through decentration to the one light of his conscious awareness of the source of all knowledge. Until he knows the why of effect and its deceptions, he has no knowledge whatsoever upon which he can rely. 
he has not but unreliable information. Information concerning the body, for example, does not give knowledge concerning cause of body or of the body's relationship to the universe. Information of birth and death of the body on the assumption that the body is self never can lead to knowledge that body is not self or that self is immortal. Nor can information concerning the material body alone, its chemistry and its functionings, heal the body. Bodies manifest life. But life is cosmic. Life is not in the body. Life is spirit, and spirit is still. Life is not chemistry or germ of matter. To heal the body so that it can manifest life of the spirit self of the body, one must give the unbalanced body the balance of the spirit. Knowledge of the light can alone do this. All the information in the world will not heal a body unassisted by the light in him, who heals and in him who is being healed. I am light, but the light which is me is not the sensed light of the sensed universe of my creation. I, the creator, think, I think in two lights, extended from the one light of me. Yet those two lights are not me, nor is my thinking me. Verily I say, I give of me and I take away, for I am the imaginer who builds image forms to tear apart to build anew. I am thinking mind. I just thought of the tower in the tarot cards. Verily I say, I give of me and I take away. For I am the imaginer who builds the image forms to tear apart to build anew. I am thinking mind, forever thinking the changing image of my unchanging self. My image changes ever with the changing of the two lights of my thinking though I, myself, change not. All things change, and their changing still images me, yet they are not me. From the Divine Iliad. Chapter 7 Knowledge versus Thinking Man's knowledge is his power. His thinking is the expression of that power. The expression of power is not power, therefore thinking is not power. As man gradually becomes aware of his omniscience, his thinking intensifies in voltage in proportion to the increase in awareness of his omniscience. Thinking is an electric wave extension from the centering fulcrum of knowledge, which seemingly divides knowledge into ideas and sets those ideas in motion to create forms of ideas as product of knowledge. Man's knowledge is like a deep well of still water. His thinking is like a two-way pump which divides the quality of that stillness into quantities of parts and sets them flowing. That is what the objective universe is. Quantities of many seemingly separate forms of ideas, all of which are but parts of the one whole idea. Each seemingly separate part is a dynamic extension of the one static unity, but separateness only seems, for all are indissolubly bound together in light as one part. Knowledge is the foundation of man's concepts. Thinking transfers concepts into product. The quality of man's products depend upon the degree of awareness of his knowledge, and not upon the quality, quantity, or intensity of his thinking. Water cannot be drawn from an empty well, nor can clear water be drawn from a muddied well. Likewise, good product cannot come from intensive thinking unless knowledge backs that thinking. No idea of mind can ever become matter. Idea of product can never become product. Moreover, no expression of anything in nature is the idea which it expresses. The product of idea is not the idea it simulates. Idea is cosmic and cannot be produced in matter. Idea must be conceived in the mind before it can be simulated as product. Conceptions belong solely to the magnetic God light and never become matter. A lever, for example, moving upon its fulcrum, expresses the idea of power by motion. But the idea of power is in the still fulcrum source of power. It is not in the moving lever. The lever would be both powerless and motionless if it did not have the stillness of the fulcrum from which to extend the simulation of power. A watch expresses the idea of time, but the watch is not time.
Likewise, it expresses the idea of mechanical principles, but the watch is not the idea which is expressed by those mechanical principles. The printed poem is not the idea expressed in the poem. That printed poem has no meaning to anyone whose intelligence is insufficient to reflect the idea from the composer's mind to his own. No idea of mind ever becomes matter. Likewise, neither the musical composition on the printed page nor the art of music which issues as sounds from musical instruments is the inspired idea of the musician. Inspiration can never be produced. It can but be reflected from one inspired mind to another recognized one. Idea and inspiration may be echoed from spirit to spirit, but they can never become product of matter and motion. Man's sense seeing with his eyes binds him to the illusion of my dual thinking. For I but build illusion with my dual thinking for his sense seeing. Sense seeing binds man to forms and things, while mind knowing opens doors of glory to the opposed threads of light with which I weave all idea of mind into forms of many moving things. Mind seeing decentrates unto the farthest reaches of my universe of me and sees all forms as one. With his seeing eyes, man sees light as matter energized, but senses not that the energy of matter is the light of my divided thinking. With man's unseeing eyes of spirit, he knows the light of me, the source, and knows that he is bound in me as one, and I in him. Behold in me thy God of love, the one, inseparable, from the divine Iliad. Chapter 8 thinking versus sensing. Man is still primate with very few exceptions. He has not yet learned to think powerfully from knowledge. He is just beginning to think as an extension of knowledge. We sense electrically and mistake that electrical sensing of observed effects for thinking. Sensing is not thinking. Sensation is but an electrical awareness of wave motion by other waves. We mistake the electrical records of this information which our brains have recorded as sensation for thinking and for knowledge. Information thus acquired by the senses is not knowledge, however. A man may have vast information and skill, but have very little knowledge. The greatest scientists of today, for example, are well informed. They know how to do wonderful things, but they do not know why of what they do. Information from observed effects and skills and putting those effects together for useful purposes have multiplied vastly since man's first observed natural phenomena. His sense of observation told him how to make a boat, then a sail for the boat. Then he discovered the wheel and fire. Electric awareness of effects of motion plus memory plus the power to reason objectively gave him the ability to do this. Very little of it has been due to either thinking or knowledge. We thus confuse sensing for thinking and knowing when, factually, we have been but functioning through sensed electrical awareness acquired from information. The information thus conveyed is electrical, not mental. The telegraph message which goes over any wire is not the thought conveyed by that message. Even the typed telegram is not the thought conveyed by it. Its symbols inform the thinker of the thought conveyed by it, but it is not the thought. Thus, it is that our vast, mechanistic, electrically motivated universe is intersensitized for the purpose of informing every nerve ganglion in every cell of every organic and inorganic part of it of the condition of every other part of it our supposedly five senses in speaking of an electrical awareness which we call sensation we think of our senses as five in number these are the senses of seeing hearing tasting smelling and feeling All of these five senses are but the one sense of feeling. We do not have five senses. Seeing is a sensation of feeling light waves through our eyes. Hearing is a sensation of feeling light waves through our ears. 
tasting and smelling are sensations of feeling light waves reacting upon mouth and nostrils. All variation in sense of feeling is due to a difference of electric conditioning, impulsing wave matter. If pulsing wave matter is but an electric wave record of thought, the sensation likewise is but an electric wave record of thought. Neither of them have reality, neither of them are the thought they record. It also follows that if matter, motion, and substance are electric records of thought, then sensation has no reality. For sensation is but an electrical awareness of wave motion by other waves. It likewise follows that if matter, motion, and substance are electric wave recordings of thought, then electricity which records thought and thought itself are non-existent. There is but one thing in this universe, light, the still light of all knowing, the one light which is God. God alone lives. His thinking and imagining is knowing. The knowing universe is all that is. Knowing mind is still. There is no activity whatsoever in the universe of either spirit or matter. Empirical knowledge. Man's present civilization is erected upon the foundation of empirical knowledge, obtained through his senses. What is empirical knowledge? The definition in the dictionary is conclusions founded upon experiment and observation alone. In other words, the so-called knowledge upon which man relies is founded upon the evidence of his senses, or more simply, upon the non-existent waves of motion of a non-existent substance. Nice, huh? That fact is the answer as to why mankind has, as yet, practically no knowledge. During his amoeba and jungle days, he lived a purely sensed existence. His body cells were controlled entirely by instinctive flux threads of light extended to him directly from the Creator. Man is still new. Out of millions of such years, he has had but a few thousand years since the dawn of conscious awakened in him the slightest suspicion of his spiritual inheritance. The advance of man since the first messengers of God appeared on earth to kindle an awakening spark in him, has been based upon information gained by his senses and stored in his electric brain as memory records of sensed observations. These observations he has reasoned into sensed conclusions by an electrically sensitized brain. All such conclusions which are based upon the evidence of senses have within them the element of deception which characterize all effects of motion in this three-dimensional universe of illusion. Man is aware of some of these illusions, such as those of perspective. He is aware of the fact that railroad tracks do not meet upon the horizon, but he is not aware of the fact that all effects of motion are not what they seem to be. He is thus misled into forming conclusions which have no relation to nature whatsoever. One can have no knowledge of effect, for all knowledge lies in cause. Our new fundamental laws and principles must be based upon knowledge of cause. Laws based upon illusion. Newton, for example, confessedly did not know what gravitation was, yet wrote laws concerning it based upon his observation as to what gravitation did to an apple. Also, he concluded that the moon would fall upon the earth if it were not for its motion. He even proved this mathematically, not being aware of the fact that those same mathematical formulae would apply to every satellite, planet, and star in the heavens, as well as to every electron in every atom, none of which are falling into their primaries. Observers in natural phenomena are still calculating the age of the universe and weight of the earth. The universe is ageless. It had no beginning. Likewise. The earth has no weight in respect to anything else in the universe. Every orb in the heavens is in perfect balance with every other orb. Messengers of the Light What little knowledge man has acquired during these last few thousand years has been given to him by the very few geniuses, prophets, mystics, and other messengers of the light who have come to re-inspire mankind with their inspired knowledge. From these rare few, the beginnings of our culture have sprung.
Without them, there would be no understanding of beauty in the world. Without beauty, man would still be barbarian. Through beauty alone will he gradually become consciously aware of his oneness with the light. When man knows the light, he will know all things. Today that light is so dim in all mankind that no one has as yet fathomed the secret of light or of gravitation, radiation, electricity, growth, life, reincarnation, or the wave. The day has now dawned when he will know these things. This is man's inheritance for this new age. I'm probably going to wrap it up after this next set of the Divine Iliad for tonight. I'm getting sleepy. So this might be in parts. Behold in me the one light from which a seeming two lights appear as pairs of rhythmically interchanging opposites. These are my light messengers. They are my workers which build my imaged forms and give them back to me devoid of form. They are the pulsing heartbeat of my body, the makers of forever borning cycles of my imagining and forms of things. The two are equal halves of one. They never can become one. They forever interchange to simulate a balanced unity, which they never find, for they never can be aught but two. From me one light extendeth to give form to my imaginings, and give them pulse beat to simulate eternal life in them which is in me. The other light dissolveth that form, and giveth it back to me unquickened, for resurrection in my rest to repeat my imaginings. Say thou, therefore, that life is eternal in man through eternities of resurrections of him in me, and say thou also that his resurrection is his own, for he is one with me. Thus my imagined dual light, universe, born, dissolved, and reborn, concentrated, decentrated, and reconcentrated, integrated, disintegrated and reintegrated forever and forever in my imagined universe of imagined time and space. And behold, each of my pairs of opposite expressions of me are reborn through me as the other one. Again I say, there is naught but rebirth in me. There is no death. Go thou and tell to man that both life and death are but mirrors of each other, which becometh each other in their forever interpassing, through each other to their still fulcrum in my knowing, from which both sprang into seeming being, to record the imaged forms of my thinking. From the Divine Iliad. I'm going to let that be for tonight. I hope you've enjoyed this. I will try to get the rest of this up as quickly as possible. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you're enjoying this. And keep listening. There's some really interesting stuff here. Take care. Till next time. Good morning. Here's the next section to the secret of light. I'm going to see how far I can get this morning. We ended on chapter 8, so let's begin with chapter 9. Thanks again for watching. Chapter 9. Sensing binds all things. The electric intersensitizing of the two pulsing light extensions of the one still light is for the purpose of recording thought patterns in matter. Mind knows but one idea as a whole. Thought is idea taken apart and patterned as separate idea. Thought is patterned idea electrically expressed and electrically recorded in matter by its two pulsing, interchanging lights. This universe of matter in motion is but the electric record of thought. The process of recording is to take the one undivided universal idea apart and express it as many seemingly divided parts. This gives form and multiplicity into many seeming parts and things of a universe of but one thing. Electricity is the servant of the God mind. Electricity expresses the desire in the God mind for creative expression by seemingly dividing the one still light into transient waves of spectrum, divided positive negative colors of light. 
This entire universe of seeming substantiality consists solely of transient light waves in seeming motion. Motion itself is illusion. Seeming separateness. All pattern thought creations of God or man are the interweavings of the spectrum colors of the two electric opposites of light waves into the pattern designs of those thoughts. Creation might be likened to the tapestry weaver who knows the one idea as a whole, then thinks it into parts, then records those parts by interweaving their spectrum colors into the many forms which, together, manifest the whole idea. To exemplify our meaning, consider any one part of the whole idea of creation. Iron, for example. Iron is a separate part of the whole. We think of iron as a hard, cold metal with certain properties, which make it possible for us to manufacture it into many products. When iron is in its frozen condition, we do not think of it as light, but we can photograph by it if we heat it to incandescence. Not only is it then light, but all of the properties which make it available to us as iron have then gone out of it. It is as though the divine tapestry weaver had unwoven all the threads of the idea of iron and sorted them into their spectrum colors thread by thread. The physicist can tell you what elements those threads of light would be if frozen. Upon looking at them, he would say, that is iron. But it would not be the form of iron as we know it. It would be the formless idea of iron as the sun knows it. There is no separateness. In the incandescent sun is all idea that earth knows. The idea of the apple of earth is in the sun. Likewise, the wood of the tree and the violet in the meadow. Likewise, the cool earth is there, with its rivers and mountains. All idea is one idea in the light of the sun. The light of the sun is never divided into its many seeming separate ideas until it is electrically extended from the sun and those extensions electrically echoed back to it. The sun is a crucible which melts all ideas into one, then sets them out into space to cool and separate into many units of that one. Likewise, idea of mind never becomes the many ideas of creation until electricity divides the one idea into many separate parts. The one light cannot be divided, but extensions of the one light can appear to divide it. The spots of sunlight upon the cathedral floor are many but they are all extensions of the one light of their source in the sun. Likewise, all mankind is an extension of the one idea of man, for man is but one in the light of his source. Likewise, all moving extensions of the one still light, as manifested in the white light of suns and the black light of their surrounding space, are but extensions of one source. All idea is still. The cinema exemplifies this meaning. Upon the screen are many pattern ideas in noisy, violent motion. We know, however, that all of the motion of separate ideas and all the sounds emanating from those patterned, moving forms would instantly cease if the still source of light from which these images and sounds are projected were turned off. We know that the cause of all this transient division into positive and negative effect is in the one still light from which it is projected. We know that the sounds we hear emanate from that stillness, yet we seem to be totally unaware of the fact that all of our pulsing universe is but an extension of one still light of universal mind, projected through positive and negative light upon the universal screen of space. It is difficult to conceive Earth and all of its phenomena of motion, sound, people, animals, and plant life as a motion picture projection from our sun. Yet all of the separate ideas of Earth are in that one incandescent light of the sun. All are but one thing, light. Turn off the sun and all of its patterned ideas on Earth would instantly cease. The still idea which is extended into motion is not in the motion, but in the stillness from which it is extended. For I say that man who senses but clay of earth in him is bound to earth as clayed image of his earth. Clayed images of my imagining, who knoweth not me, in them are but dwellers of earth's dark. To sensed man the doors of my kingdom are self-barred by darkness until the light of me in him is known by him as me. 
Until then, he is but moving clay, manifesting not me in him, while sensing naught but moving clay of him, knowing not the glory of my light in him. Wherefore I say to thee, exalt thou thyself beyond thy sensing. Know me as fulcrum of thy thinking. Be me as deep well of thy knowing. From the Divine Iliad. Chapter 10. Function of the Brain. Electric awareness of observed effects of matter and motion is registered in the brain. It is commonly believed that the brain thinks and knows. The brain does not think, nor does it know. It is but a storehouse of recorded sensations. The brain remembers these records for man's usage as he needs them, and for fulfilling the requirements of his body. The brain is a complex state of motion expressed by waves of light pulsing in cycles. States of motion cannot know anything, nor can they think anything. The brain is part of a machine, a human machine. Machines can express thoughts which are electrically projected through them, but machines are incapable of thinking the thoughts thus projected. Likewise, machines can do marvelous things when patterned and controlled by knowledge, but they cannot know what they do. The centering conscious mind of man's soul will alone thinks by projecting desire for creative expression through the brain machine. Desire in mind is electrically expressed. Electricity is the motivative force which projects the one light of mind two ways to create cycles of light waves for the purpose of expressing thought cycles. Desire is not in the brain. It is the centering conscious self Desire is the cause of all motion. It's italicized, so I'm going to say it again. Desire is the cause of all motion. The brain records sensations. The brain is but the electric recording mechanism of conscious mind thinking. It is also man's storage warehouse of electric records of memories and thoughts since his beginning. It is the servant of universal intelligence. It operates all mechanisms of the body. It acts as the central switchboard for all its instinctive, voluntary, and involuntary actions. The brain is the seat of sensation. Its purpose in this respect is to keep the body electrically informed of the condition of the body through electrical messages. Such messages are not mental. They are purely electrical they produce sensation. The brain senses and records every message. It sends counteracting messages to other parts of the body. The body is a vast and complex mechanism. The brain is an electrical recorder, distributor, broadcaster, and receiver for all operational parts of that multi-celled machine, but its actions have no relation to intelligence. The brain records sensations of experiences and observations which the senses convey to it. Such sensations are mistaken for thinking and knowing. Sensation arising from electrical motion is purely automatic. The mistake in assuming that the brain thinks and knows is due to the fact that man believes himself to be thinking when he is only sensing. Man also believes that he is acquiring knowledge through sensed observation of sensed effect, when he is but recording electrical sensations which inform him as to the nature of things observed by his senses. The body is a pattern machine designed to do many things. Electric motivation through nerve wires determines each movement. When such sensations act in unison with his conscious awareness of the light, which centers him in person, he is then thinking as well as sensing. The centering consciousness of man, the person, transforms information received by the senses into knowledge to the extent of which he is capable of recognizing cause in spirit back of the effect which his senses record. Until that transformation takes place, man is without knowledge, no matter to what extent his senses may have informed him, for information is not knowledge. A man may be a veritable encyclopedia of information. He may have earned many college degrees for being well informed, and yet be without sufficient knowledge to create anything. For instance, we cannot sense the idea of a harp while it is still, but we can know the idea of the harp 
we can know its various possibilities of expression, even though its strings are not vibrating. Likewise, we can imagine countless complexities of rhythms, which lie unexpressed within those still strings. Conversely, we cannot know the vibrations which come from those strings when we set them in motion. We can but sense those vibrations through our own sensed electrical awareness. The source of all things is within all things, centering them as rest, from which their motion springeth. It is also without all things, controlling their balance with all other things. Man's universe is still composed of many things, many separate things, all separable. Yea, not one thing is there in my imaged universe which is apart from me, nor of itself alone. Yea, I guide my morning things from very seed by sensed threads of light extensions of my thinking until they themselves can guide themselves, not in the least of these which are not bound to me in light. Images of my imaginings which grow from earth and those which freely move, all of these things grow and move through extended light of my dynamic thinking until they themselves can think with me. From the Divine Iliad, Chapter 11, Electrical Awareness. This material universe of many seemingly separate parts is electric. The whole universe of countless parts is wired together by an electric flux of nerves which inform each part of the universe of the ever-changing condition of every other part. There is no sensation between balanced parts or balanced conditions of matter. By sensation, we mean the feel of the electric current which conveys the message. The electric current is impossible in an equilibrium condition. Hence, we can feel no sensation whatsoever when our bodies, or parts of them, are in a balanced condition. Electrical awareness is necessary to an electrically mechanized universe. An electrically controlled machine in one's factory has exactly the same electric awareness that a man has. Its wired nervous system conveys electric messages to its parts for the dual purpose of motivating them as well as for adjusting all parts to each other in continuity. Electric machines do what electric awareness demands of them through sensation. So does man, tree, the solar system, and every nebula of the heavens. Man's body cells are electrically aware of their mechanistic purposes and respond to electric messages sent to them. They have electrical cell memory of their individual and group purposes. They act automatically when sensed reflexes are electrically motivated. Bodily functions such as our heartbeat, digestion, chemical gland transformation, breathing and walking are automatically operated by cell memory reflexes. Cell memory and instinct causes birds to migrate, spiders to spin webs, and certain vegetable growths to close in on flies and fish. Instinctive actions and cell memory reflex actions are not mental. They are purely mechanical and automatic. Electric awareness is universal. This principle of electric awareness through sensation is not limited to animal life alone. It is equally characteristic of the mineral and vegetable kingdoms. It extends to the various electronic particle and to the mightiest galaxy. Not only is each particle in each mass electrically aware of its purpose, but each particle in the entire universe reacts in response to electrical messages sent to it from every other particle in the universe. This physical universe is controlled solely by electrical sensation, which is measured and balanced by the still magnetic light centering all things. For behold, saith the Universal One, I am within all things centering them, and I am without all things controlling them. From the Divine Iliad. All of the electric universe of motion is thus so perfectly conditioned by the two electric workers which build the universe and tear it apart sequentially for rebuilding, that all moving things in it sense all other moving things in it. Likewise, all differently conditioned things in the universe readjust their conditioning to every change of condition of every other thing in the universe. 
There is a constant separating process in nature which forever expresses the universal desire for change and multiplicity and there is likewise a constant leveling process which forever expresses the universal desire for oneness. Don't tell Dale I'm drinking from his cup but I think he already knows. <laughs> Whatever. For some reason I really am partial to this cup. I like it because it looks like one of those tin ones but it's not tin. I, with man, am creating man in my universal image. What I am, man is. I think man, and man appears in the pattern of my thinking. Man thinks man, and man appears in the image of man's thinking. Man's thinking is my thinking. All thinking things are thinking my thinking. All creating things are formed in the image of my thought imaginings to manifest my thought imaginings. The universe is my image, creature of my imaginings, from the Divine Iliad. Chapter 12. Instinct. Organic matter generates purely from the desire of mind to manifest idea into matter. That cosmic desire to create form produces the desired form. Desire is the motivating force of all creation. Man begins to express the idea of man as a single cell. The whole idea of man is in that single cell. It then unfolds in orderly time and space according to cosmic law. Likewise, the whole idea of all creation is in that single cell. All idea is omnipresent. There are no parts of the whole. Each step in the unfolding of the man idea follows the continuing desire for unfolding. Cell memory of purpose is given to each cell as it unfolds. Pattern of idea follows in sequence as desire in God mind and desire in the growing idea work together to express the idea in form. Every action of unfolding man is a part of the unfolding of the man idea as it exists as a whole in God's mind. Any desire of man is therefore a two-way extension of the light of that idea from God to man. Whatever God desires to express in man, he will express, for he is man's creator. Whatever man desires, the God in him will create. Man must, however, co-create with God, according to God's universal law. If man breaks that law, the law will break him into an equal extent. Life is a sequence of experiences. All of the expressions of desire in the unfolding of any idea are a part of the idea. They are experiences in decisions. All experiences are parts of the unfolding of any idea. Whatever those decisions are, however, they are recorded upon the individual man as his own interpretation of the man idea. Likewise, they are recorded in the whole of the race of man as the sum total of all desires and experiences of the whole man idea. As the idea of anything is one, so also the parts of that idea are one. Instinctive Intercommunication If it were not for instinct, animal life could not survive or develop. Instinct causes mechanical actions to take place in all bodies to meet the necessities of existence. Instinct protects animal life from enemies. It tells the proper food to eat, how to build nests, how to take care of its young how to return home when taken great distances, as the carrier pigeon does, and countless other wonderful things that animals do. A salmon spawned in a certain river instinctively leaves that river and makes its way to the sea until maturity. At the proper time for its mating and spawning, it then returns over thousands of trackless miles to the very river in which it was born. It is instinct which tells birds to fly south before winter. Instinct tells them the direction of south. Instinct tells them it is warmer in that direction. Instinct likewise governs the migration of seals, the building of the beaver's dam, and the weaving of the spider's web. Instinct might be defined as a cell memory record of all actions of a body and of all the sensations caused by those actions. The beginnings of instinct. Without instinct in all animal and vegetable life, their evolution would not be possible. All creations of the Creator are the result of electric wave recordings of the Creator's thought. 
They are parts of the whole idea, taken apart and put together bit by bit. They are the result of universal law of cause and effect. I guess I'll talk to you guys while the train is flying on by. This is really interesting stuff. It makes a lot of sense. One of the first ways um, I learned there was more going on to this world than I had previously thought was using a pendulum. It proves this principle, what he's talking about, and he may get to that, I don't know. But it proved to me that um, I could know the truth and I could know things that were going on just by learning to play around with a pendulum. Anyway, fascinating. I'm going to get back to it. I think the train will be quiet as it speeds on by. It takes millions of years for complex organisms to recognize the spirit within them sufficiently to think at all. During these long ages, they are guided almost entirely by their instinctive reflexes. Man alone has begun to think, reason, imagine, create, and invent, and then only during the last few thousand years. Instinct is, therefore, God control over the actions of his creations. The involuntary actions of the body, such as the heartbeat or the action of white corpuscles, do not know their purpose in the healing process of the body, but God centers and controls every atom of his creation, and each must fulfill its purpose. Instinct building by God and man. A good example of the manner in which God and man work together for creative expression is the familiar knitting woman. Knitting is part of the man idea, which requires a skill. A woman who desires to knit must desire to acquire that skill. Desire must precede all expression of that desire. Slowly she takes one stitch at a time. All of her power of concentration is needed to take those first stitches. Each stitch taken, however, has within it the desire for taking the next stitch. Very slowly she interlaces yarn into the pattern required. The cell of her fingers gradually acquires cell memories of their purpose. These cells coordinate with other cells of the body in the development of the whole skill. Gradually she learns to knit instinctively. Her mind is freed from concentration, and she may think of other things and converse freely. Her body cells alone will work from the memory of purpose given to them. Instinctive skills are thus imparted to bodies of man by the co-creative efforts of God and man. The pianist teaches his fingers to work instinctively in order to free his mind to think music. God is working with him. Without this moment-to-moment -moment cooperation with God, he could do nothing. God, creator of all things, knows all things and has all power. Man and God are one. Man may know all things and have all power to the extent in which he desires to know all things and have all power. Awareness of the light in man will give him all knowledge and power. Man may not be apart from God at any time, nor can any part of creation be apart from God at any time. All things come and go from my divided thinking. All things go from very heart of me into my imaged universe. And when they disappear from there, I also take them back to very heart of me. Know thou that all creating things are resurrected things, again manifesting life of me through my divided thinking. Man divides his thinking in manifesting me. The body of man sleeps that it may awaken in me to manifest me. The body of man dies that it may be resurrected in me to manifest me. The body of man disappears that it may reappear to manifest me. Man who sleeps or dies or disappears is but man's image, for self of man sleeps not, nor dies, nor disappears, for self of man is me. Again I say that I am one, and man is one in me when he knows that I am he. From the Divine Iliad. Chapter 13. Unconsciousness, Sleep, and Pain. There is much confusion regarding the supposedly possible condition known as being unconscious. When we sleep or are anesthetized, <laughs> I don't know how to say that word. <laughs> when we sleep or are anesthetized, we say we are unconscious. We cannot be unconscious. We have always been conscious without the slightest awareness of it. 
Our confusion in this respect lies in mistaking sensation and thinking for consciousness. When we stop thinking, whether asleep or awake, we do not stop knowing, nor do we cease being consciously aware of our being. We but cease to set our knowledge in motion to express idea through the pulsations of thinking. Conscious mind does not sleep. Sleep is merely the negative half of the wave cycle of electrical awareness of sensation. Wakefulness is the positive half. All nature sleeps when the sunlight lessens the ability of all things to manifest life. Sleep is the death half of the life-death cycle. One may say, I am unaware of this or that, but one cannot say, I am unconscious, when one is always conscious. Conscious awareness is knowing. Unawareness means that one does not yet know. Knowledge is within him, which he can know when he desires to know. Sleep and wakefulness are positive negative wave parts of a wave cycle, just as birth and death are opposite ends of a life cycle. Sleep is but an anesthetic. Sleep can be induced chemically, either to the whole body or any part of it, by desensitizing its cells. When the body or parts of it are thus put to sleep, they have not been rendered unconscious. Their voltage has merely been lowered. The dentist does not refer to a local anesthetic as having produced unconsciousness. He refers to it as a desensitizing condition. But when the surgeon desensitizes the body, it is then supposed to be unconscious. We assume that the brain has stopped thinking. The brain does not think. Therefore, it cannot stop doing that which it never does. We assume that bodies cease to be conscious, but consciousness is never in bodies. A local anesthetic stops pain. Pain is a too intense electric current. The voltage is too great for the nerve wires to stand the strain. They burn out. And the overcharge of burning out causes the pain. When the nerves of the body feel an electric current running through them, the body is aware that something is happening to throw it out of balance. When the body is in balance, it has no sensation. When the body is unbalanced, sensation informs it when and where, otherwise it could not function. Wakefulness and sleep are merely the charging and discharging of the uncountable electric batteries of the body. If these batteries were kept constantly charged, there would be no such alternating conditions as sleep and wakefulness. This planet is carrying us on our uphill journey to our pinnacle. The sun is the generator which charges its batteries. The sun is that generator, but the earth is turning toward and away from its generator continually. As the sun's charging light disappears from one edge of the planet's rim at evening, everything goes to sleep. Conversely, all things awaken at the dawn. The batteries of all things on earth are being forever charged daily and discharged nightly. I center the moving shaft of my universe, yet I move not, although its power to move springeth from me. I center growing systems and changing cells of growing systems, yet I change not, and though their changing patterns spring from me. I center living things which manifest my life, but they live not. I alone live. Growing things are moving things in man's sensing, though they move not in man's knowing. Moving things are changing things in man's sensing, yet they change not in man's knowing. Even though fast moving things of man's sensing move fast, they simulate the rest while moving, from which they sprang into seeming motion, from the Divine Iliad. Chapter 14 Motion Simulating Rest this electric universe of motion forever moves to find rest, but never finds it. Matter in violent motion simulates rest and balance through violent motion. The more violent the motion, the greater is the illusion of rest and balance. Motion can cease, but it can never become rest. This make-believe universe. The entire dynamic wave universe of electric matter is not what it seems to be. Everything which seems at rest depends upon violent motion to make believe it is at rest. A wire wheel could appear to be a steel disc if spun fast enough. The faster it is spun, the more at rest it would seem. This planet seemingly at rest is in violent motion around its centering point of rest from which it is electrically extended. 
Seemingly motionless clouds floating above the Earth are rotating with it at the tremendous speed of 1,000 miles an hour at the equator, or four times faster than a plane. All the planets are evolving swiftly around their central sun, which seemingly stands still in the heavens of space, but in fact is moving with incredible speed. Likewise, all the stars of night simulating rest are moving at terrific speeds to adjust their mutual unbalances in this dual universe of divided pressure. The pencil in one's hand, the desk upon which one is writing, the room full of motionless things seeming to be at rest are but simulating rest through violent motion of their many parts. Tremendous vibrations may be in that glass paperweight. Not one thing could manifest the rest it simulates if it were not for the incredible speeds of those atoms, which so incessantly rotate and revolve to make that seeming restfulness possible. Even still things are not still. All seemingly still matter is manifesting make-believe rest by make-believe motion. Motion itself is an illusion. The motion one senses in one's brain has no more reality than the motion which one senses in a motion picture. The seeming motion of the cinema is caused by sequences of changing pattern forms projected on the screen, which give the impression of motion because of the rapid change of pattern in the negatives. That self-same illusion applies to the material universe. Without change, my play of creation could not be played, nor its actors be. Behold, therefore, the changing universe of my imagining, the seeming universe of my thinking. And again I say that there is no change in me, the changeless one, so also is there no change in my thought, universe of pairs, of opposed things, which forever interchange to simulate my universe of change. He in the seeming changing of my thought, universe, is not change, save for senses of sense things, which are bound to pairs of parts of wholes. Each pair wendeth its way through the interchanging pressures of its electric journey. Each appeareth, then disappeareth, to reappear. He in those senses of sense things, sense changing in all things, they change not to conscious knowing. Why for be thou slave to sensing? Rise above thy sensing. Be me in thy knowing. From the Divine Iliad. Chapter 15. The Illusion of Change Change is an illusion of the senses due to motion. There is no change whatsoever in the conscious universe of knowing. There is only an illusion of change set up by the two interchanging lights of thinking to divide the one whole idea into many separate ideas and record them in moving matter. The senses are the audience for these thought pulsations. The senses are a part of this illusion. Senses are electric. They belong to the thought universe of motion and do not respond to stillness. As motion itself is non-existent, so also are senses non-existent. The senses are but the imagined records of imagined motion and change. As such, they are limited to pinhole peaks into the vastness which extends beyond their sensing. The senses have no knowledge of what they sense. They merely record motion. The senses respond to motion in only one direction. They sense the forward flow of time, but not its backward flow. If they could register both directions, they would become aware of the stillness of the zero universe of seeming motion. The Universal One planned it this way. Otherwise, there could be no sequential manifestation of thought which constitutes the creating universe. When our knowing exceeds our sensing, we will no longer be deceived by the illusions of our senses. A man seeing a technicolor motion picture for the first time and without knowledge of such electric effects would think he were looking through a window at real happenings, unaware that it was but an illusion created by projecting positive light through pattern negatives. That is all that creation is. Two lights projected through each other to simulate motion form and change. Our senses are like passengers on a fast-moving train. They sense parts of the landscape as they rush forward, while to their senses the landscape rushes backwards. The senses interpret these effects as matter in fast motion, which is forever fast changing. A man seeing the same train from a mountain would sense that same fast motion and fast change as changeless and still. 
As man unfolds from sensed man to spiritual man, he gradually becomes aware of the two-way motion of all effect. That two ways being the visible effect which responds to his senses, and the invisible effect which he knows but does not sense. Gradually the time arrives in his unfolding when his full awareness of cause voids all reliance upon sensation. He then rises above his sensing. He then knows the universe of motion for what it is instead of for what it seems to be. See thou no more with outer eyes alone, for thou hast knowing eyes to void the illusions of thy sensing. Throughout long eons man hath walked his earth with eyes of outer seeing, giving belief to that earth of his body sensing. Throughout his new eons he must walk the earth of inner seeing and know me, in it as but visioning it in light of me and light of him. For I think earth and earth appeareth, disappeareth and reappeareth in balanced rhythms of my thinking. Wherefore I say, man's earth and man are but my imagining, to come and go with my imagining. It is not me, nor is it him, nor is it in what it seems to be to him. Nor shall man longer place earth before me, gaining aught of earth and not of me. For I am a patient God. I patiently await awakening man. Awakening man is he who knoweth the light of me in him. Man may choose his own eons for his awakening, but know me he must. Until that day man's agony of knowing shall be man's alone. His knowing must be his own desiring. Knowing man is ecstatic, cosmic man. He who beginneth to know me in him, yea, in him who suspecteth me, in him hasteneth his unfolding to cosmic man of all knowing. From the Divine Iliad Knowing man is ecstatic cosmic man. He who beginneth to know me in him, yea, in him who suspecteth me, in him hasteneth his unfolding to cosmic man of all knowing. From the Divine Iliad Chapter 16 The Senses Deceive Imagine a perfectly motionless wheel and a fly walking around its rim, moving ever forward over changing ground, and the wheel seemingly moving backward. During a continuity of time in which the fly sensed a constant change in the changeless wheel, every time the fly got back to the same point, it would compute the past time consumed on the journey and the forward time necessary for the next circuit. The wheel being still, motion, change, and time are created by the fly itself, as it takes the whole idea of the wheel apart by journeying around it and examining it bit by bit. The fly sensed motion by changing its position on the wheel. It sensed change by finding a seeming difference of condition at each forward movement. It sensed time by creating the sequences necessary in taking the one idea of the wheel apart and dividing it into many separate ideas. This simple analogy is a good symbol of creation. This planet, like the fly on the wheel, moves forever around its motionless orbit. The orbit is as rigid and still as the wheel upon which the fly is moving. As the planet moves upon the wheel of its orbit, it senses constant motion and change. It senses changes of days into nights, of spring merging into summer, autumn into winter. All of these seeming changes are in the motion of the planet and not in the wheel of its orbit. Each change is entirely due to the motion of the planet and not the changeless orbit. The planet itself registers change on its changeless wheel. Change, therefore, lies in motion alone. The senses are motion, therefore the senses sense only that which they themselves are. Inadequacy of the senses Man overrates his senses. He places too much dependence upon them without justification, for they are not recording all of the phenomena of his surroundings. He likewise trusts them too much without justification, for they are constantly deceiving him. While his senses are recording the stillness and rest of nature, on a lazy afternoon they are failing to record the violent motion of everything in his entire environment, from the blade of grass to the clouds in the heavens above him. Those seemingly motionless clouds are moving at the speed of a thousand miles an hour at the equator without the slightest evidence of that swift motion being recorded upon his senses. 
The Earth also is moving many miles per second in two directions, one of rotation upon its axis and the other of revolution around its orbit. His senses register stillness. They are electrically unaware of that motion. This deception is as it should be, just as the same deception in a cinema is as it should be. God's universe is but an electric recording of His knowing, manifested by His thinking. To thus record the idea of His knowing in the two lights of His thinking, a three-dimensional universe is necessary. If the senses could detect and record all motion instead of but a part of it, the illusion would disappear. The senses would see behind the illusion and find that all motion voids itself. Division of the whole into parts causes the illusion. If the film were removed from the projector of the motion picture, the illusion of motion and change would be voided. That is what creation is, the one light of knowing divided into the pattern parts of thinking. Sensing is but an electric tension set up by the seeming division of one into many which strain to fulfill their desire for oneness. When a unity of condition is consummated, sensation between those parts ceases because the tension ceases. The senses, being but tension of desire for unity between divided parts, have no existence. The senses are electric flux threads of light connecting every particle in the universe with every other particle. They are the intercommunicating nerves of the one universal body. When strain of desire for balance, rest or unity ceases, sensation ceases. In this electric universe, sensation is the strain of resistance to the separation which exists between all separated masses. All matter is one. Separated particles desire to find that oneness. It is part of God's plan that the senses are limited entirely to the recording of a very small fraction of effect. The senses can never sense the whole, but the conscious mind can know the whole. These words I now say for newly comprehending man of his new cycle. Love ye one another all men, for ye are one in me. Whatsoever ye do to one in me, ye do to all, for all are one in me. Love thy brother as thyself, serve thy brother before thyself, lift high thy brother, lift him to high pinnacles, for thy brother is thyself. For of a verity I say, love of self, or nation of selves, turneth neighbor against neighbor, and nation against nation. Self-love breeds hate, and soweth its seed in all the winds to blow, wherever it will. Wherefore, say I, love of neighbor for neighbor, and nation for nation, uniteth all men as one. Serve first thy brother, hurt first thyself rather than thy neighbor, gain not from him unbalanced by thy giving. Protect thou the weak with thy strength, for if thou use thy strength against him, his weakness will prevail against thee, and thy strength will avail thee not. He who giveth love prospereth mightily, but he who taketh aught gaineth not. Why for lose all to gain the world, gaining not? He who hath not laid up a treasure in heaven to equal treasure, gained of earth, has sought the dark. For him the light is far. From the Divine Iliad Chapter 17 Man's New Cycle this coming age will mark an epochal advancement in man's evolution toward his goal of omniscience and omnipotence. Man becomes a higher being with greater power as he acquires knowledge. In knowledge alone lies power. Only through knowledge can man become co-creator with God. Knowledge can be obtained by man only through awareness of the spirit within him. Lack of that awareness is the tragedy of today's civilization. During the last century of the greatest scientific progress in the history of man, great nations of the world have killed, robbed, and enslaved other men to build their own empires. Even today, man kills by the millions, condoning his killing as necessary for his self-preservation. He is now but reaping the seed of his sowing. He who lives by the sword shall die by the sword. No man can hurt another man without condemning himself to greater hurt. Fear dominates the world of today. While fear is in the world, love cannot also be. 
Love can never dominate the world until man ceases to live a primarily sensed existence and knows the light of the spirit within him. This new age brings man one step nearer to the universe of greater knowing through greater comprehension of man's relation to man and to God. Each past cycle in the growth of man towards higher levels has been illumined by the few inspired messengers of the light who have known God in themselves. New inspired messengers who know God in themselves will likewise give the light to this new cycle, and these few messengers of the light must multiply into legions, for the need of a spiritual awakening is great. Man's whole reason for being is to gradually pass through his millions of years of physical sensing into his ultimate goal of spiritual knowing. Man has now reached a transition point in his unfolding where he must have that knowing. He can acquire that knowing only through greater awareness of the light, of the universal self, which centers him as one with God. Oh, okay, so we're at a new section. This is interesting, and I will include it. It is a graphic, The Secret of Light, Part 2, Omnipotence, the Universe of Power. And basically it is, one, the creating universe appears from the one and disappears into the one. There's like a totem, two plus signs put together creating a totem on either side. And there's a plus minus on one side and then a minus with a plus under it on the other side. And a spiral, one going in, well they're both, like they're both they both feel the same. Interesting. Cool, I love it. Okay, it'll be, I'm sure you're looking at it as I'm speaking. I left room. I spoke about it on purpose so that I would have room to put that graphic in there. Okay, moving forward. I think I'm going to stop there. I'm going to stop there. That's a good stopping point before we jump into the next section. This is getting good. I love it. It's simple and easy to understand. It's really ringing true for me. I hope that it is for you. I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. Even if you're not, I'm still enjoying it. <laughs> A lot of times when I make these YouTube videos, it's like, oh, whatever, Kim, who are you making these for? Eight people have watched it. I don't care. I'm enjoying it. Eventually, some people will see it that need to see it. Even if, I guess, one person sees it. It's supposed to see it. That's all that really matters, right? Because we're all the same. We're all one. <laughs> Have a great day. I'm going to try to edit this and get it uploaded as quickly as possible, hopefully today, so I can charge on through this. This is fascinating stuff. I think I do want to read more of his books. Leave me a comment. Let me know which is the most exciting part for you so far. What are your thoughts about all this stuff? Take care until next time. Omnipresence, the universe of being. In my universe, there is but one form from which all forms appear. That one form is the pulsing cube sphere, two halves of the heartbeat of my dual thinking. All forms pulse, therefore all forms are two, one form for the in-breathing pulse, which generates, and one for the out-breathing, radiating one. The cube is the sphere expanded by the outward breath to black rest in cold space, and the sphere is the cube compressed to the incandescence of white hot suns by the inward breath. All spheres emerge from the pulsing, breathing cubes of space and return to them to find fulcrums of rest for reemergence. Behold, I center one form where it seeks rest in me from the action of my thinking, and I envelop that form with its other half where it may again find rest in me as another fulcrum for expression of my thinking. These two sexed halves extend from me and return to me, but they are not me, nor are they two halves of one, for they can never be two halves of one.
they are always two and never one. Nor can they unite nor meet, for their ways are opposed ways, which never meet. For each one voideth each in their seeming meeting. Behold, I am within all things, centering them, and I am without all things, controlling them. But I am not those things which I center and control. See thou that man knows that each divided light of his conditioning which extends from me to him is balanced always. For I am balance, and that is truth and the law. For I am truth and the law. Say thou to him, each thing is everything and each is everywhere. For I say that all things are the same things. For all things are universal. Each thing reaches through every other thing to the farthermost star. For this purpose have I set my mirrors and my lenses of dual light to attain an infinity in my imaged universe in which no measure is. And I also say that man's infinity ends in the eyes of man where it began. All things in my mirrored universe end where they began. Eternity thus ends in now and now in eternity. See thou that man well knows the illusions which deceive his sense seeing. Point out to him my mirrors and my lenses which curve my universe of seeming into imaged spheres of my thinking as seed for multiplying one into many ones. Say thou to him, all things occupy the same space, and each thing occupies all space. All things extend from all things and are extensions of all things. Likewise I say, all things center all things and are involved in all things. Say thou these things in words of man's knowing, and say thou that I, the light, center him and all things else, for I am everywhere. From the Divine Iliad. Harmonic centers of the same measure of desire extend their actions outward from their centers toward other harmonic centers. Harmonic explosions of equal measure thus fill all space in God's omnipresent universe. Outward explosions which meet each other cannot be spheres, for all space must be filled. Harmonic centers of the same measure of desire extend their actions outward from their centers toward other harmonic centers. Harmonic explosions of equal measure thus fill all space in God's omnipresent universe. Outward explosions which meet each other cannot be spheres.
for all space must be filled. Tennis balls crushed together become cubes by gradually flattening where they meet at six points on curved surfaces. Likewise, outer explosions flatten into the six planes of cubes. Outward explosions are resisted at their maximum in the direction of the six points where spheres meet. They are consequently deflected to the eight points of least resistance which become diagonals of cubes instead of radii of spheres. Eight directions of two-way expressed force are thus generated which become the basis of the octave wave. Outward-inward explosions projected through each other develop two opposed pressures. The outward direction divides its potential by expanding it radially. The inward direction multiplies it by compressing it radially. Thus, the two opposed plus and minus equilibrium conditions are produced which motivate this electric universe of two-way motion. Give to it its heartbeat and produce all effects of illusion caused by the interchange of the two conditions of matter, the cube sphere. Pairs of interchanging opposed conditions are born from each other and become each other as a consequence of that interchange. As all opposites in nature are likewise born, the cube and the sphere are the two opposites of form, from which all forms of all things are born. from which all forms of all things are born. They are the only forms ever created, being father-mother of all forms. The sphere and the cube both manifest the cosmic principle of balance. Their position in light waves is in the one balanced position in the wave where compression and expansion have ceased to oppose each other, which is at wave amplitude, known as trough or crest. compression and expansion have ceased to oppose each other, which is at wave amplitude, known as trough or crest. Carbon and sodium chloride are good examples of true cube crystallization. Likewise, their atomic units are true spheres. Sodium iodide or sodium bromide do not crystallize in true cube because of their unbalanced positions near but not upon the plane of wave amplitude. The cube and the sphere are one, being two opposite phases of the same thing. The cube and the sphere are one, being two opposite phases of the same thing. The cube is the sphere extended to black coldness, while the sphere is the cube contracted to white incandescence. When man's whole body wears out and needs replacement, he likewise rests in a longer sleep. Man's body is but patterned waves of light in motion. Waves disappear into the ocean's calm, but they reappear. The ocean is a part of the idea of creation. Waves express the idea of the power of the ocean, but the power and the idea are in the calm of the ocean, whether expressed by waves or not. The turbulence of the ocean springs from its calm just as the movement of the lever springs from its still fulcrum. All motion is a two-way extension of stillness. We do not think that the ocean is dead while it is at rest in its calm, for we know that it will again manifest its power by waves of motion when desire is strong enough in it for manifesting it by motion. Waves of light which give transient form to a man's body are but his body. They are not the man, nor the man idea. 
the body of the man is an extension of other waves of father mother light in the sun and the idea of man exists in the still light which centers the sun man can never die for he is omnipresent light and he exists everywhere likewise man's body cannot die for man's body manifests immortal man and immortal man always has a body in which to manifest this body which extends from the earth disappears into the heavens and the earth but that which disappears to sensed man of earth has not ceased to be for its pattern has been recorded for repetition it still is and will reappear the senses of man are not attuned to the rest of the cycle of man's bodily journey from disappearance to reappearance but man's knowing reaches out over the entire cycle and man can know eternal repetitiveness of his body when he knows God in himself when water disappears beyond the senses as water vapor and gases we know they will reappear as water when they have completed their cyclic journey as man knows the light in him he will as surely know that he will return from eons to complete the purpose of manifesting his creator as one part of the whole idea that purpose cannot be completed in one life cycle nor in ten times ten million life cycles man has but begun to express the man idea on this planet he still has a long way to go and the body he needs in which to manifest will return to him as surely as the light of day reappears from the darkness of night into which it has disappeared what happens after death the unanswered mystery of where do we go when we die needs a comprehensive answer abstractions and theories are not satisfying nature's processes are simple and are all alike what happens to one thing which disappears happens to all things there are no exceptions to this process of nature assumed that matter was a spatially extended field. Spherical. Right. So what's the difference between Einstein's view and your view of matter? And what are the similarities? Research in, um, in energy transfer, and this is what we're talking about, when we're talking about forces between particles. Research in, in energy transfer has shown that it is always quantum mechanics which gives the correct description that is one particle changes a quantum wave state for example that might be a source and somewhere somewhere else another particle changes its state exactly the opposite way this one goes down a certain amount of energy and this one will go up a certain amount of energy exactly that's the conservation of energy we, we realize that all energy is transferred in this way. It's one of the very important measurements to show that um, how the W coupled to uh, its particles to produce a finite interaction.
research in energy transfer has shown that it is always quantum mechanics which gives the correct description. That is, one particle changes quantum wave state. For example, that might be a source. And somewhere, somewhere else, another particle changes its state exactly the opposite way. so tightly bound that if you try to pull it apart, the little pieces of gluons that hold it together break apart and they produce more particles and more particles and more particles, but you never get free quarks. But anyway, the thought is that in initially in these experiments, there would be another size, another thing. The quarks would actually be composite particles and they would in turn be made out of subquarks. 